Hello to everyone and welcome to a new episode of Hobo, a wandering podcast about cinema. Uh, in the last episode with uh, our co-host Ricardo, we talked to Joaquin Cosini about uh, Los Huesos, a stop motion film uh, co-directed with Cristobal Leon, which won the Horizonte Prize at the Venice Film Festival in the short film category. So if you missed it, we suggest you to check it out. Today we move from Chile to Georgia and we are very happy to welcome Alexandre Koberidze who found his second future, What Do We See When We Look at the Sky, placed prominently within the main competition slates of the Berlinale Online edition of this year where it was met with considerable acclaim and the receipt of the Fipresci Prize. Hi Alexandre and thank you for joining us today. Hi guys and thank you that I'm here and for the interest. Uh, I'll take just a few seconds to briefly introduce the movie to our audience. Uh, taking place in the sun-drenched city of uh, Kutaisi along the uh, roaring uh, Rioni River, the film tells a fable of a uh, meet cute between uh, a boy and a girl, Georgie and uh, Lisa. Uh, they immediately feel the pull of love, but an evil eye will disrupt their union because uh, they will wake, will, uh, wake up the day of their first date, uh, looking completely different and bare felt of their most valuable knowledge, uh, which is pharmacology to Lisa and soccer to Georgie. So lost in their new identities, of course trapped in, the, in their new physical aspect, they show up at their rendezvous, but obviously miss each other. So they start living close at hand, but never realizing the other is actually there. And it's a film uh, in which no single moment is deemed more important than any other. And the film flitters from one character to the other and the camera drifting gently to gaze upon objects, animals or buildings before loop looping back to develop the central story. So my first question is about this aspect of this film. It's interesting to see how observation become fiction and vice versa in your work. So how do you manage to balance the sudden elements of your films with the scripted ones? Um, hello again. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a question of uh, feeling, I think. It's uh, uh, things like this, the, this observational parts are already um, in a script. I, I try to write things down, but uh, um, also, uh, we try when, when we shoot to, to have time to not only shoot the things we planned, but also things which are maybe going on around the set. Or sometimes to have just some free days where we don't know what we want to shoot, but we just can go out and shoot the stuff. Um, and then the actual uh, balancing of, of this kind of things happens in editing. Uh, but uh, you have to, to, to gather some material to have this stuff already in the editing. And uh, then uh, for me, it's, uh, I tend to have more and more and more stuff like this, which not directly related to, to the story in, during the editing and uh, sometimes uh, some people who watch the edit say it's too much, some say it's okay, and some people you believe, some not, uh, and at, at some point you understand, okay, maybe now, uh, now it's okay. Wow, thank you. And uh, I have another question for you, and uh, most of your films have some elements of magical realism and mysticism, and of course this one is based on the magical transformation of the leading characters. What is your relationship with fairy tales? And do you think that cinema has a magical component in it? One of my, not problems, but yeah, maybe problems with uh, fairy tales in uh, how they are told often in, in films, in cinemas, um, uh, is, is the way that somehow very often it's, it's uh, shown as, as, as a fantasy of a protagonist in a real world or some uh, parallel world or some, some feelings uh, or some memories. Um, for me, it was important to, to show in this film what I think and I feel that these kind of things are part of our daily life. Um, I have a feeling less and less uh, and 
I can imagine that long time ago, there was more part for stuff like this in a daily life. So uh, the main goal was to, to give to this kind of things more space, more time, but not separate them from the reality, but to say this is also reality. And um, cinema is, yes, I, I also, when I was thinking how, how can the main characters get rid of this curse, um, which is also kind of magical thing. Um, uh, one of the modern uh, things which exist today and is kind of magical, I think, is cinema. Uh, not in, in this, I don't know, in a romantical way, but uh, for me, just as a, as a filmmaker, there, sometimes I see things, uh, I see films uh, which I can't explain. And this can be a definition of some magical thing which is absolutely unexplainable. And uh, your previous film was set in uh, Tbilisi, then you moved to Kutaisi for this one. Uh, were you already familiar with the town before shooting the film? And did you let yourself be inspired by other films set there? I didn't know much about the modern Kutaisi. Um, Kutaisi, when you live in Georgia, when you grow up here, you, you know much about the past uh, of the city because in the school you learn the history of it also many important people for us came from Kutaisi. So you know many things about the past, but not about, at least I didn't know much about the, the present life there. So I went there and we spent almost, me and the cinematographer and the producer of the film, we spent there almost a year before starting to shoot. Um, and it was a time we had to, to understand the place, to understand the rhythm, uh, to see some places, to know some people. Um, and during this year also the, the script started to change quite a lot because uh, we were discovering things which were not planned, but we thought we want to have it in our film. There are a few, few films um, which are placed in Kutaisi and uh, we were, I, I was watching it very often and because there is this, for example, we have this bridge in the film, which plays also a very important role um, part in some films which are made there. And uh, I don't know, for, for, pe for people who have not seen these films, uh, it's, these are just moments in our film, but for, for Georgian audience who, who knows the films which are made there, these moments are which they recognize and they somehow connect these films together. I've noticed uh, uh, something uh, funny into uh, this movie, uh, uh, in, uh, and I have this, this question for the, for the Italian audience, for our Italian audience. Uh, just past the midpoint of the movie, uh, there is a five minute mon montage of children playing soccer. And the score of the scene is the song uh, Un'estate Italiana by Gianna Nannini and Edoardo Bennato, which was the 1990 FIFA World Cup anthem. And how did you uh, come to choose this song? And do you have any particular memories related to that World Cup competition? Yeah, I, um, I was six or five when this um, World Cup uh, was held. I won't lie, I wasn't watching the football there. It was just this song which was all the time there. Uh, and uh, and this, I don't know, I, 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 I can remember the final game, only the last part of it, like this uh, pic pictures of Diego Maradona crying, uh, which was shocking for me because I don't know, I was five, six year old boy. Uh, I thought it's the worst thing you can do to cry. Uh, and somehow I saw a man and then my mom explained to me that he was the best player ever and he was crying in front of 100,000 people and somehow it was, he was not ashamed. So uh, this song and this kind of huge uh, emotions uh, which you can have and you don't have to be ashamed of it. Uh, somehow, I don't know, I, it, it stayed in me, I think, forever. And somehow this song is connected for me with the biggest passion. 
with with the passion when you can cry. Uh, so I don't know. I think I was just having it, this this thoughts in me for for years and. Uh, when I started this film, where I also knew it, it, it has this football elements, I thought, okay, maybe now is the time I can sh share this these feelings with uh, all the other people. One of the key features of, of this movie, I think, is the uh, hidden rhythm amongst all the things that are happening uh, simultaneously around the characters. So uh, this movie seems to be primar primarily a, a matter of breath, timing, and and momentum, like football. Actually, uh, I would like I would I would like to ask you what came first in your life, football or cinema? I think football. Uh, I think. Um... Maybe it, it came together because the, the story I told now about, about Maradona crying, uh, it was maybe like the first images which I can remember uh, in this way, which, which were kind of not shocking, but very powerful. And uh, it, on one hand, it's football and on the other hand, it's not cinema, but still it's like images you see. But uh, with the cinema, uh, I, I, I started to, to, to love it quite a late, um, maybe with, uh, I was watching it, of course, but not, uh, not more than anyone else around me. I think it was like I was 20, 21 when I started to, to watch it more, maybe a bit more than my friends, not much more, but, uh, and maybe have a bit more interest. Uh, and with the football, it was different. I, I as, as long as I can remember myself, it was uh, always the biggest joy just to wake up and go out and play football for a whole day and um, come home. Now it's a bit hard because uh, none of my friends want to play it. So uh, I, I desperately look for people who, who would play with me together. Uh, and um, cinema became somehow part of my life. Um, it's a, I think it's, it's a strange thing because if, if I was, I don't know, 10 now and if I could choose, I would definitely choose football as a way of living, but uh, not everything happens as you wish. I think. And I don't know, I, I, I don't complain. Um, I, I, I can, uh, or this life together with cinema is for me also very interesting and teaches me a lot. Here in Italy, we had a great, uh, a great player, a football player from Georgia, no? Calazze. Uh, Calazze, you, you, remember, uh, you remember him. And so you have a great tradition no? about uh, football uh, and, uh, and you played, then the Georgian uh, team played uh, several times uh, against Italy. I, I remember that also, so I, I can understand your, <laughs> your, uh, your particular affection to, to, the, to the football. So, Davide. Yeah, you've moved from high definition digital with your shorts to uh, shooting Let the Summer Never Come Again on a cell phone camera, uh, and now filming this new one, uh, both digitally and on 16 millimeters. Uh, how do you decide what format best fits the stories you are trying to tell? It's a big question. I think uh, every time you start to make a film, it's one of the first questions a, a filmmaker not has, but maybe it's good to ask ask yourself. And um, because I think every film has a, it's has to have its its own look, its own aesthetics. But somehow the, the, there are these standards, like uh, which uh, which somehow they say, okay, this is maybe how a film should look, and all the others, it's not a film. And if it looks like this, then it's experimental film, and uh, stuff like this, which is, uh, I think, uh, things which work against uh, against cinema generally, because uh, it's it's like if you ch would choose only one color to paint or only one stone to make uh, sculptures, when you have many things to choose. So for me, it's every time a question, uh, and uh, every time I try to 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 try different things. Uh, uh, I want to make now a new film and again I want to use uh, the same 
cell phone camera, uh, the Sony Ericsson one I used uh, with let the salmon air come again, uh, because I know it suits more this this film and um, I miss also the, this aesthetics and also this way of working when you can work alone. Um, it's a huge difference. About the music of the film, along with the sound and sound design, is credited to your brother, Giorgi Koberite. What kind of work have you done on the score? When I started to edit, um, immediately we started to, to, to work um, on the music. Um, because uh, I had this idea also before starting to shoot that, that we were making a kind, a kind of a silent film. So, so it was clear that the, we, we wanted to have pretty much of music uh, and um, different kinds of it. Um, also, I knew that um, I can edit some parts of the film or not edit some scenes, but take them as a whole only with music, or I can know if they work or if they don't work only with music. So uh, it was a very parallel work, uh, like every day uh, working together. Mostly we were not in the same place, but uh, with long emails, so long talks, um, sending each other stuff, uh, kind of uh, bringing this music, which she was writing parallel to the uh, editing and the visual things every day near and nearer together that at some point we said, okay, this is enough. Um, for me, it's, a, I don't know, very somehow magical thing also again about magic, but also you mentioned this, this rhythm that you can take some, some piece of music which someone made, which is made of with some uh, rules, some musical rules, uh, and then put it on, on some image, uh, not edited uh, sequence, but some, uh, maybe some very long uh, shot. And you see that there are some similarities that, that these rules of, of making music are also accepted uh, in, in, in our surrounding. And sometimes the, this rhythm which someone created is you can see it also in the images. It's, um, and so when, when you see it, you have, want to have it more of it and that's how it grows. Now we have a, almost an hour of music in the film. I was going to ask you uh, uh, about you know uh, silent movie as a as a as a, as a reference for for uh, for this for this movie, and uh, it, uh, silent films has been have, have been a reference also visually and uh, not just uh, about music but also as a, as, a, as aesthetic. That's uh, that's what I meant. No, not only for music, but uh, when I was just thinking, uh, what kind of film is it or how, how, what kind of storyboard do we make and uh, where, where do we look for the ideas? Um, it was mainly, not only, but mainly when I, when I tried to imagine how we edit the sequence or how we shoot, I was trying to think about films from, from, from beginning of the past century. Now another question about the cinema, about the Georgian cinema. Uh, can you tell us a little about your relationship with old Georgian cinema? Uh, which directors and which films uh, are particularly close to your heart? Uh, and which ones later converge into your work, maybe? There is one, one, one short film called Peola, which is uh, also... In the, the story is told in the same city when we were shooting, but actually this other film is uh, shot in other town, but, and it's also about football. And there are many things we, we took from, from Peola. Um, but maybe from, <clears throat> for me, the, uh, the film which is nearest to, to the thing we were trying to achieve is uh, a shepherd from Tusheti by Soso Chaidze. I mean, if you would watch the film I made and 
the shepherd from Tusheti, uh, there are no direct similarities. Uh, yeah, but uh, this film was kind of a, a direction or a, a thing or a direction we wanted to go or something we wanted to achieve. Knowing from the beginning it would be impossible because I, uh, I don't really understand how um, how he managed to go uh, so far, but still, uh, when you have uh, it's like a star you are following, you know. Um, and also many other films, films by Alexander Rechvashvili, which. Um, also, aesthetically, if you watch them, you wouldn't compare them to our film, but uh, it's more like a feeling you, you follow. I've got a final question. Uh, watching the movie, it came to my mind uh, a quote from Francois Truffaut, uh, which said, the life of a child is full of premeditated little crimes and the life of an adult is full of unpredictable accidents. Do you personally agree with this view of life? It's... I don't know, it's one of my big um, fears, maybe uh, when I think how much the accidents are, are, are driving or changing the life or how, how much of things which are going on are in our hands or is it something in our hands or it's all destiny written by someone somewhere and uh, also making films somehow helps you to, to, to understand a bit more of stuff like this because you, there are things you plan uh, and there are things which are going on and you can't change them anymore. And sometimes these things are quite good. Sometimes you get presents uh, and sometimes it rains when you want to have sun. Uh, and sometimes you do what you really want. So I think the life for me is like the all these three things together. On one hand, I think there are things which, which are there for you, but also I think there are things you can decide by yourself. And I also think that there are these coincidences which are, which are there for you. And then, then it's up to you what you see there and how you can use it. Thank you very much. What Thank do we see when we, look, when we look at the sky? It will be in the US theaters on November 12 and coming soon to movie in the US, Canada, India, Turkey, Latin America, and of course, Italy. So our advice is don't miss this film for any reason in the world. And thank you so much, Alexandra Kolarize, for your time. Really. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your time and the interesting talk. Uh, Hobo will return in December with uh, a new episode, so we'll be back in a few weeks. Thank you very much.